together. And then you can... What is this? Good morning, everybody. I guess what I haven't done. Figured out. Oh, wait, I think this is show 52. We're going to call it 52. seconds. Show the ball. I guess what today is, everybody? Nothing. Today is nothing. Did everybody see the eclipse? Actually, you know what I want? I want that one dude to call me today. I want to talk to him about... About aliens... Wait, hang on, everybody. I get, I know, I need to listen. I'm listening to you guys when you tell me to turn the music and stuff down. Okay. And also, do you guys like this music more? Or do you like that loud music more? I don't know. I mean, it's not like I really get... Actually, I'm talking to the dude, the guy, the uh, guitar player from Descendants. Because he's a friend of mine. I'm asking if I can use my world and use get the... Uh, get the... Um, get the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what do you call that? Copyright thing. Just to be able to use it for, for, uh, for my podcast. Cause I love fucking my, and it, it goes, right? My world. It's a, um, so, yeah, that's it. Okay. So anyway, that'd be awesome. Uh, I hope everybody's doing okay. I'm going to go get coffee. You guys go get coffee. I'm getting work late. It's going to be a late day. Does everybody see the whole, the solar eclipse today? Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you? I got some cool pictures, so I'm going to go to coffee. You guys do the same thing. I'll be back. Hey, Lincoln. What's up, dog? Lincoln, Lincoln, don't, 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 don't go over there. Here. Don't like don't worry, we don't like them either, do we? No. Oh, 
there. Did you know that? Oh, come on, don't do it. Uh, Crazy lady, what's up? How are you doing today? I'm glad that you're joining. I'm doing this thing for a second. I'm just waking up. I'm going to wake up. Crazy, hey, uh, I'm right here. If you want to say, if you need to, if you want to talk, you know, uh, I'm waking up. I'm going to go get this coffee. How was your weekend? Crazy. <laughs> I love your name. Did you have a good weekend? Um, oh, no, sorry. I was talking to, I was talking to my pot bean homies. What I thought of something funny the other it was like it wasn't I don't remember now like Lincoln, Lincoln, come here. Lincoln, no 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 not 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 that far. <laughs> You're not that like wake up today. Get your ball thinking. Let's go. Uh, what, uh, the one you put on the fighter pallet? Um, oh, I got to write it up, don't I? Shit. Shit. Do you know what the other box was? The other red box that was on there? Which one? There was the one that had stuff written on it. And then there was another red box for the fighters. I got it on the counter there. Uh... Oh yeah, that's it's 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 just inch and eight by nine. I gotta just oh, oh my god, you fucking gotta be kidding me! Jesus fuck, I can't believe that just happened. 
Oh, wait, that's not a Monday fucking thing. Okay. That is. That is a Monday thing. Let me go throw this shit away. I'll go wreck it some more. Jesus Christ. Oh, it's such a Monday. I just put my cup down and it spilled all over these fucking tickets. That is such a Monday fucking thing, dude. I cannot fucking believe that just happened. You know what? I can't believe it. Never mind. Jesus, God. That's why I have this plan, everybody. It's Monday, and I've got to get... Yeah, I cannot believe that just happened. I can't. Never mind. <laughs> it's like tripping over your shoelace. And when you bend down, to, bend down to tie your shoelace, you hit your head on the corner of a table. What's up, Brian? Okay. Let's see if this will even copy. Damn it. This is not what I wanted to do. By the way... Start this thing over. There we go. COD? Yeah. Yep. Uh, 25 of those? Come on. Thank you. Go all the way through. Do it. Nice. Okay. Oh no. Yes. Good morning. How you doing? I'm all right. Thanks. Cool. I spilled coffee all over the plating tickets. Go figure. Yeah, it's one of those Monday things. Man. What's up, man? Lincoln, come on. Lincoln! Come on. God, I wish I were like Lincoln, so happy to be at work. Lincoln just... Loves it. Okay. Let's try this again. Jesus Christ. I can't believe I did that. Um, Thank you for doing that. Uh, I'll get... Yes, it's a big problem. True. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to get that. Thank you for doing that. I can't believe I did that. No, I was uh, I was going to uh, to write some plating stuff down when I put the coffee down and uh, yeah, it spilled. I've never done that. <laughs> Boy, it's one of those. Usually that's the way I wake up. That's yeah, what I'm yeah, exactly. Burn the shit out of myself. Yeah, 
It's one of that. It lets you know it's Monday, you know. I'm going to tell one more person about what I did. <laughs> Sorry, Todd Bean family homies. Lincoln, God damn it. Check that dog again. Oh, Lincoln. Oh. There he is. That's my little jumpy baby. <laughs> Where did your ball go? He loves jumping over shit. Oh, his ball is gone. There's no way. Seen his ball. Sorry. a little bit more sense. Is that not the plating palette? Huh? I guess that's not the plating palette anymore. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. I, I'm not doing all that other stuff on the truck while I lift it up there. Oh, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll help you do it. I don't want to stand I have no idea where his ball went. Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. It's okay.
about to get pissed off. Is this a filtration? God damn it, dude. Son of a bitch, dude. Oh, he turned the curtain ticket in on shit that's already been cut. He's a fucking retard. He turned the curtain ticket in from where? Oh, oh well. We got extra now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, let's see out here. Come on, Lincoln. Yeah, you have to go home in a minute. All right. Let's not do that. Let's just see. I'm oh, about my fucking. Come on, get inside. What? Oh, fucker. God damn it. Seriously? I got a fucking charging fucking cord. Guys, come on, Lincoln, get inside. Just stay here. Did you, um, is that, it's probably in your name, is that in your name, the gas? Yeah. Have you, like, put your, okay. Oh, I'm trying to open this thing in the app. Oh, shit. Shit, no. Oh, you don't have to. I need this. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna get to stay here.
me feel better. I like my YouTube channel, but all right. <clears throat> Ooh. Okay, Legan, come on. Beyond that, there's likely a much greater amount of universe out there that's unobservable to us, possibly part of a bigger multiverse. Yet even though our scientific efforts have revealed an enormous number of details about the universe we inhabit, we have yet to find another inhabited world out there with even simple microbial life, much less life that's complex and differentiated, or even intelligent and technologically advanced. The question of just how alone we are in the universe remains unanswered. While there are many potential answers to this question, we lack the data for a definite conclusion. The possibilities range from a universe with widespread intelligent life to one where Earth is the only home to intelligent beings. To find the true answer, we need a significant increase in our knowledge. How are we going to do that? Well, let's find out. To begin with, I want us to divide our knowledge base into three separate sections. We'll start with what is known to be true today, in 2023, what we assume to be true based on our current knowledge, and what still remains unknown, even with our best available information. Regarding the things we know to be true, this encompasses significant achievements from both the experimental and observational aspects, supported by concrete evidence, as well as theoretical extrapolations from our best theories that explain their necessary consequences. We now have knowledge about the number of stars, how many are similar to the sun, the ones potentially hosting rocky planets and possibly life, the systems within the observable universe, and those we could observe with advanced technology. It's remarkable that within just about 30 years, we've transitioned from not no, no, knowing no, these answers the... to having definitive knowledge Fuck. about them all. Within our own Milky Way, there are somewhere around 400 billion stars, but the Milky Way itself is a particularly large, evolved, late-time galaxy compared to the average galaxy in the universe. We can analyze the metallicity of stars in the Milky Way, which is the proportion of heavy elements within a star compared to hydrogen or helium. This helps us understand the relationship between a star's metallicity and its likelihood of having planets. We can also categorize stars by their mass and spectral type to determine what fraction of them could possibly host Earth-like planets. When we say Earth-like, we mean planets that are rocky, similar in mass and size to Earth, located at a distance from their parent star that allows for similar energy receipt as Earth gets from the Sun. Currently, this is the extent of what we can measure. Lastly, we can use our understanding of star formation in the universe and our observations of galaxies, along with theoretical predictions for galaxies that are challenging to directly study due to their faintness, low mass, proximity to larger galaxies, or extreme distance, to estimate the number of potentially habitable worlds within the observable universe. All of this information falls under the category of what we definitely know to be true as at 2023. Why the fuck does in our it visible do that? universe, there are approximately 2.2 sextillion stars, God, which is about 2.2 followed by 20 zeros. These stars come in various types, sizes, and ages. Out of all these stars, only about 4%, or roughly 8 followed by 19 zeros, are observable from Earth. Most of the stars were formed in galaxies we can only see from their early stages. Among the stars, around 3 to 5% are of the same type, 
G-type, as our sun. Approximately 15 to 20 percent are cooler and less massive, K-type. And the majority, about 75 to 80 percent, are the coolest and least massive red dwarf stars, M-type. Only around 2 percent are bright, blue, and have a short lifespan. For stars to potentially have rocky planets, they need to contain a sufficient amount of heavy elements. On average, this cutoff is around 25% of the heavy elements in our sun. Stars with more than this level account for about 98% of known planets, while those with less make up only about 2% of all known planets. Even with these criteria in place, we still have an enormous number of planets that could be considered as potential candidates for supporting some form of life in the universe. There might be around 10 to the power of 19, or possibly more according to some estimates, such planets that could be observed from Earth, assuming we had incredibly advanced technology, but remained within the confines of the laws of physics. Now to move forward, scientists must rely on assumptions because we have only one example of a known world with life, Earth. Beyond this point, we venture into the unknown, and it's essential to be transparent about the assumptions we are making. We assume that life originated through natural processes from non-life, and any planet with the right chemical ingredients and environmental conditions, whether similar to Earth or different, can be considered a potential candidate for life. We assume that the fundamental laws of physics we observe on Earth and within our solar system are the same laws governing the entire universe. We assume that life is defined as an entity capable of extracting energy from its environment, utilizing that energy for life processes, and either reproducing or producing related offspring in some manner. Although these are common assumptions among biologists, astrobiologists, and most scientists who study the origin of life, there are often people who make different assumptions about one or more of these. So it's important to state the naturalistic position explicitly. Additionally, there are also cosmological assumptions to consider. We assume that the unobservable part of the universe follows the same fundamental principles and shares similar or identical conditions with the part of the universe we are acquainted with. We also assume that the process leading to the hot Big Bang, known as cosmic inflation, not only resulted in a hot Big Bang on a much grander scale than our observable universe, but also aligns with the predictions of inflation and the constraints set by our observations of the observable part of the universe. There is an unobservable universe that goes on for at least 400 times the radius and 64 million times the volume of our presently observable universe. It's filled with the same sort of stuff that comes to exist in our universe, including the ingredients for galaxies, stars, planets, and life. And there may be an inflationary multiverse separating different pockets of space or different observable universes from one another. This should create overall an enormous set of disconnected universes that are not only beyond our own observable universe, but beyond our unobservable universe as well. However, it is only the portion of our universe that's within our light cone, which is where we can potentially receive signals that were emitted since the Big Bang that we consider as detectable extraterrestrial life. Unfortunately, we now move from the known and the well-assumed into the realm of speculation. Science has yet to answer these challenging questions. What is the mechanism by which life originates from non-life here on Earth? What are the various mechanisms by which life can arise? And how common are these mechanisms? When life emerges, how frequently does it endure for long periods versus getting wiped out shortly after appearing on a world? In cases where life arises and endures, how often and after does it evolve into what we call complex and differentiated life? Once life becomes complex and differentiated, how frequently does it evolve into intelligent and or technologically advanced forms? And how long do species that capture our interest in that sense persist? <laughs> Regrettably, we lack any evidence that provides answers to these questions. We must find answers to all of these questions before we can address the fundamental question. Could we genuinely be alone? However, our ignorance has never stopped us from what we'd call making healthy speculations, and we won't let our lack of concrete knowledge stop us here. Currently, the leading what? theory regarding the origin of life from non-life involves a process known as peptide oh, really? RNA coevolution. The concept revolves around the notion uh. that a collection of amino acids, the fundamental building blocks of proteins, spontaneously formed in a watery environment in the presence of a natural energy source. 
This theory gains credibility due to the abundant presence of both water and various amino acids in objects like protoplanetesimals, which are remnants from the formation of our solar system, such as asteroids and comets. While there are only approximately 20 amino acids, all with the same handedness or corality, involved in life processes on Earth, icy and rocky celestial bodies contain more than 80 amino acids with various choralities. When these amino acids combine to create peptides or proteins, these new molecules can carry out metabolic functions. Introducing ions okay. to a peptide can make it function as an enzyme. By connecting some form of nucleic acid, the magic never leaves you when you stay with the Disney Resorts Collection. Making every day more magical than your last and bringing you extra time in any of the four theme parks. Start saving today. is the best time to get into Survivor. Everybody yes. getting your first look at the new Lulu tribe. Everybody at once. Jaw drop. For the first time in the new era. Oh my god. The fate in the game is about to change. That's crazy. This is new era Survivor. I gotta be ready to jump ship. Thank god I'm a good swimmer. <laughs> a new Survivor Wednesday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Whether it's based on ribose sugars, RNA, peptides, PNA, or other xeno, meaning stranger in Greek nucleic acids, XNA, you can bestow upon them the capacity for reproduction. Yeah. Unfortunately, we must now transition into the realm of complete speculation, which I would consider to be rather speculative if we wish to calculate probabilities. Currently, there is no scientific foundation for ascribing any probability or likelihood to the following. Life emerging from non-life. Life persisting for billions of years or longer on a planet. Life evolving into complex and differentiated forms. Complex and differentiated life evolving into intelligent and potentially technologically advanced entities. Our only evidence for any of these processes comes from Earth. On our planet, life emerged from non-life relatively early, no later than 3.8 billion years ago, has been thriving ever since, became complex and differentiated at least around 600 to 700 million years ago, and even evolved into intelligent beings, such as humanity. If each step is reasonably likely, let's say with a 1 to 10% chance of happening on candidate planets, then there could be anywhere from 100 billion to trillions of planets within our observable reach that at some point, develop intelligent life. On the other hand, if one or more of these steps are quite unlikely, let's say with a one in a billion chance, it's plausible that, in the context of intelligent life, we might indeed be alone when it comes to reaching and discovering such a civilization. While our primary interest may lie in discovering intelligent and technologically advanced alien species, a worthwhile scientific pursuit, it's crucial not to limit our search to what we hope to find the most. If we were to encounter a planet where the most intelligent life forms resembled dolphins, dogs, alligators, or even spiders, we would not only be thrilled, but would also make every effort to understand and communicate with this unfamiliar intelligence. Even if all we discovered was a world with microbial life, or even simpler organisms, a scenario scientists anticipate to be the most common on inhabited planets, we would learn that Earth is not unique, and that life exists elsewhere in the universe. As long as we remain the only known example of life, we could consider ourselves exceptionally fortunate in the cosmic lottery of biology. However, if we were to find a second instance of life, it would not only provide hey, reasons to believe that there are many more, but also enable yeah. us to begin estimating the prevalence of inhabited worlds. In 1950, Enrico Fermi asked, where is everyone? If there's life everywhere in the universe, why don't we see any signs of it? For over 60 years, we've tried to explain this, calling it the Fermi Paradox. Water, light, heat, organic molecules, and the building blocks for life are indeed abundant throughout the universe. However, we have yet to encounter any form of extraterrestrial life. As far as our concrete evidence goes, Earth might be the sole abode of life in the entire universe. If this notion appears pessimistic to you or aligns with Carl Sagan's characterization of it as an awful waste of space, you're not alone. 
Originally, there was no straightforward method for estimating the number of technologically advanced civilizations, but Frank Drake came up with a brilliant approach. He devised an equation that involved multiple parameters that could be estimated and then multiplied together. If your estimates were accurate, the equation would yield an accurate count of the technologically advanced civilizations in our galaxy with which humanity could potentially communicate at any given time. This concept was ingenious, but as our understanding of the universe has expanded, the Drake equation has become less useful. In its current form, the Drake equation might even be less effective, but we now possess sufficient knowledge about the universe to develop an even more improved framework. The Drake equation in particular aimed to calculate the number of civilizations, n, present within our galaxy at any given time. It was expressed as the product of seven distinct unknown factors spanning the realms of astronomy, geology, biology, and anthropology. These elements build upon one another, and they are as follows. R. The average rate of star formation, FP, the fraction of stars that possess planets, NE, the average number of stars with planets that have planets capable of supporting life, FL, the fraction of these life-sustaining planets where life has emerged, FI, the fraction of life-bearing planets that have developed intelligent life, FC, the fraction of these intelligent civilizations that are capable of communicating across interstellar space, L, the length of time over which such a civilization can transmit signals or listen for extraterrestrial messages. Multiply these numbers all together, in theory, and that will give you the number of technologically advanced broadcasting civilizations we have in the Milky Way today. However, there are significant flaws in this framework. It relies on several unspoken assumptions that do not align with reality, rendering it less useful in the modern context. These issues include the fact that the equation was written before the Big Bang was validated and the steady state model was disfavored. The equation assumes that only one planet per star system could support life. That intelligent, technologically advanced life will never spread to other worlds and that broadcasting and listening for radio signals is the method by which an intelligent species would choose to communicate across interstellar space. In particular, the last assumption drove the motivation behind SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence using radio dishes, which of course has not yielded any positive results. Nonetheless, the absence of evidence doesn't rule out the possibility of other worlds hosting intelligent life. Despite our uncertainties regarding what's out there and the methods they might use to search for or contact us, the existence of intelligent, communicative, or spacefaring extraterrestrials remains a topic of immense interest to scientists and all of humanity. While many aspects of the Drake equation may be problematic and fraught with significant uncertainties, it's now 2023, and our understanding of our galaxy and the universe has expanded significantly since 1961. This prompts us to explore a more refined approach. And S, the number of stars in our galaxy. Why estimate the rate of star formation when we can simply count the stars we have today? We possess detailed knowledge about our galaxy's size, thickness, central bulge dimensions, and mass distribution. Through extensive surveys that observe the entire sky and focus intensely on narrow regions, we can state that there are between 200 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. An uncertainty of just a factor of two is quite acceptable, and it indicates an optimistic starting point. Each star represents a potential opportunity for life. Let's choose the higher figure in this range. FP, the fraction of stars with planets. We can retain this parameter from the original Drake equation, but in the aftermath of Kepler, it isn't all that interesting. Why? Because it's essentially close to 100%. Based on the extensive surveys of stars and the knowledge we've gained, the fraction of stars with planets in orbit around them is estimated to be at least around 80%. To put it simply, stating that the fraction of stars with planets equals 1 is a clear win for the optimists. FH, the fraction of stars with the right conditions for habitability. This is where it gets more intriguing. Among the various classes of stars, how many have planets suitable for life? A star similar to our sun, with the same mass, radius, and lifetime, could indeed host life, as evidenced by our own existence. However, what about more massive stars? Eventually, they may burn through their fuel too quickly, preventing the emergence of intelligent life. 
Conversely, lower mass stars might be too unstable, emitting flares that strip away a planet's atmosphere or producing insufficient ultraviolet light for life to thrive. We may also consider whether there are adequate heavy elements to support life on a planet or whether the environment in a particular region of the galaxy is too chaotic. While there may be unknowns, it's reasonable to suggest that at least a quarter or 25% of stars in our galaxy have the potential to host habitable planets. NP. The number of worlds around habitable stars with the right conditions for life. We've gained substantial knowledge from our studies of exoplanets, but numerous questions remain. What defines a world as habitable? In the early solar system, Venus, Earth, and Mars had similar conditions. In the outer solar system, worlds like Enceladus and Europa, boasting subsurface oceans, could potentially harbor underwater life. In systems with gas giants positioned similarly to Earth, large moons might witness the emergence of life. While there are significant uncertainties, it's reasonable to estimate that, on average, among stars capable of hosting a potentially habitable world, there's one world that stands out as having the most favorable conditions for life. That's the world of greatest interest. So we'll set NP equal sign one. At this juncture, we can multiply the first four numbers together to estimate the number of worlds with favorable conditions for life within our galaxy. 100 billion. This is a promising beginning. FL. The fraction of these worlds where life arises. Among all the potentially habitable worlds, how many take that extraordinary initial step, where life emerges from non-life? Or if primitive life originates in interstellar space, how many worlds witness life taking root on their surfaces, in their oceans, or in their atmospheres? We don't even have the answer for our own solar system, where it's conceivable that life arose on as many as eight other worlds at some point. The prevalence of life remains uncertain. Optimistically, it might have a 10% chance of emerging from non-life. On the other hand, it could be exceedingly rare, with odds as low as one in a million or worse. The uncertainties here are substantial, and any number one selects is as speculative as any other. In the future, we will likely gain the capability to conduct our initial tests. If we assume there's a one in 10,000 chance that a potentially habitable world possesses life, a guess as good as any, this implies there are 10 million worlds in the Milky Way where life exists. Effects. The fraction of life having worlds with complex, differentiated organisms. Attempting to classify life as intelligent or not is a matter of debate, even among the top scientists. The categorization of dolphins, great apes, octopi, and various other organisms as intelligent or not remains a subject of ongoing discussion. However, one aspect everyone agrees on is whether an organism is complex and differentiated. Since Earth is our sole laboratory for this type of development, let's take an optimistic approach in the absence of evidence and assume a one in a thousand chance that a world starting with a primitive, replicating, information encoding form of life can eventually lead to something resembling the Cambrian explosion. This estimation suggests there are 10,000 worlds in the Milky Way teeming with diverse, multicellular, highly differentiated forms of life. Given the vast distances between stars, it's likely that another planet where this has occurred is only a few hundred light years away. AFT, the fraction of those worlds that presently host a scientifically technologically advanced civilization. This question surpasses the inquiries of the Drake equation. It matters less whether this is the first or tenth time a technologically advanced civilization has emerged. It's not crucial whether they employ radio waves, whether they face self-destruction or self-extinction, or whether they harbor aspirations for interstellar travel. The primary concern is whether extraterrestrial intelligence matches our own in terms of scientific and technological advancement. There's no evidence for such civilization.
plug in hybrid. It's beyond Earth, leaving a wide range of possibilities. The likelihood could be relatively high, such as 1% of these worlds reaching the stage, or it could be a highly improbable coincidence that humanity even emerged, with odds closer to one in a billion. Even with 10,000 such worlds in the Milky Way, under these estimates, there's only about a 10% chance that another scientifically, technologically advanced civilization coexists with us. But with all that said, it's those last three numbers, FL, FX, and FT, that have such large uncertainties that make accurate estimates an impossibility right now. Knowing how many worlds there are out there in the Milky Way with life on them, and finding even one, would have tremendous implications for our existence and for understanding our place in the universe. Taking even the next step and learning that there were complex, differentiated, large organisms on a world like we have with the fungal, animal, and plant kingdoms on Earth would revolutionize what's possible. And finally, the chance we'd have to have communication, visitation, and a knowledge exchange with a scientifically or technologically advanced alien species would forever alter the course of humanity. It's all possible, but there's so much more we need to know if we ever want to find out. We must take these steps. The rewards are too great if there's even a chance of learning these answers. Many of us can imagine two different futures unfolding for the enterprise of human civilization. A future where we engage in internal conflicts, quarreling over the planet's finite resources, succumbing to ideologically motivated conflicts, and ultimately sealing our own destruction. If we never discover life beyond Earth, if we never encounter others with whom to communicate, share knowledge and culture, and who offer us hope for a future among the stars, perhaps the most probable outcome indeed will be our own extinction. But there's another possible outcome for humanity. A future where we come together collectively to face the gargantuan challenges facing humans, the environment, planet Earth, and our long-term future. Perhaps the discovery of life beyond Earth, and potentially of one or more intelligent, space-faring extraterrestrial civilizations, might give us not only the guidance and knowledge we need to survive our growing pains, but something far grander than any terrestrial achievements to hope for. Until that day arrives, we must make do with the knowledge that, at present, we have only one another to extend our kindness and compassion to. And that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and make sure you subscribe for more videos. In our search for alien life, we can receive only one of two answers. Either we are someday able to find and communicate with another civilization, or we unearth only more and more silence. We receive a signal, or we don't. Either way, we come to an important realization about our place in the universe. Not many of us want to believe, and not many of us do believe, that we are alone. Currently, we have identified over 5,000 exoplanets, but with cutting-edge observatories like the James Webb Space Telescope and ambitious projects like Starshade on the horizon, this number is expected to increase significantly. These advanced tools will enable us to better analyze exoplanets and assess their potential habitability. The presence of certain characteristics, such as seasonal changes, liquid water on the surface, or specific organic compounds, might point to the possibility of life. However, even if we find a planet with promising conditions, that alone does not guarantee the presence of life. Life might never have emerged on that world, or if it did, it could have been wiped out by catastrophic events like massive impacts or nearby supernova explosions, planets that show signs of potential habitability and harbor the necessary conditions for life to emerge, becomes one of the prime suspects for study. Specific organic compounds like chlorophyll, which are predominantly produced by living organisms, could be key indicators. Additionally, signatures of large biomass, such as those found in rainforests, could create discernible changes in environmental parameters like temperature or cloud distribution, setting them apart from barren landscapes of rocks and sand. In our search for life, we must remain open to the possibility of encountering various forms of intelligence and evolution. 
It's essential to remember that life's timeline on Earth spans billions of years, from microbial life existing for roughly 4 billion years to recent technologically advanced life emerging only in the last 100 years. Considering the vastness of the universe and the diverse array of conditions on other planets, it is plausible that we may discover life forms at different stages of evolution. Some might be in their early stages of development, akin to the ancient microbial life that once dominated Earth, while others could be on a path toward advanced civilizations, much like our own relatively recent technological achievements. But you see, as humans, our understanding of intelligence, civilization, and communication is deeply rooted in our own experiences and societal norms. However, projecting our behaviors onto potential alien life forms might lead us astray in our quest to decipher the paradox. Imagine civilizations that have evolved on distant planets under entirely different conditions and evolutionary pathways. These alien societies might possess cognitive abilities, values, and methods of communication far beyond our current comprehension. Their understanding of the universe, science, and technology could be vastly different from ours, making their approach to space exploration and communication unconventional by our standards. While we search for extraterrestrial intelligence through radio signals and other technological means, advanced alien beings might have developed alternative forms of communication that we have not yet fathomed. Their methods could transcend our comprehension, existing on planes beyond our current grasp of physics and biology. Moreover, the very concept of intelligence might vary significantly among different species. Intelligence on Earth can manifest in various ways, from human cognitive abilities to the sophisticated social structures of certain animal species. Similarly, alien intelligence could encompass an astonishing array of forms, making it challenging for us. KPMG's M&A insights and experience help CNH Industrial transform its future from a traditional farming equipment company into a digitally advanced precision player. Acquiring Raymond Industries let us develop next generation agricultural equipment, including the first ever autonomous spreader. In less than a year, we helped CNH harmonize vastly different company cultures, divest non-essential assets, and realize new growth potential. Why does finding a good movie feel like an impossible mission? Prime Video makes it easy. Find hit movies included with Prime. Here we go. In theater blockbusters. You should stop by. One app, less stress. Prime Video. Find your happy place. to recognize and understand. Furthermore, the Fermi paradox relies on the assumption that advanced alien civilizations would exhibit expansionist tendencies, similar to our historical exploration and colonization drives. However, this assumption could be overly anthropocentric, as the motives driving an extraterrestrial civilization might be entirely different from our own. Consider the possibility that some advanced alien civilizations prioritize harmony with their environments and seek to preserve their own planets rather than colonizing others. Perhaps they have found a sustainable balance and prefer to remain hidden from other civilizations, avoiding potential conflicts that could arise from interstellar contact. In essence, this solution to the Fermi paradox encourages us to broaden our horizons and remain humble in the face of the unknown. We must embrace the diversity of potential alien behaviors, acknowledging that our understanding of intelligence and societal behavior might be just one of countless possibilities in the vast cosmic landscape. Studying the patterns of human civilizations, scientists observed that many rose to greatness but eventually faced collapse. Similarly, when investigating the history of large cities, they noticed that most reached a certain point of growth and development, only to experience a subsequent decline. These findings served as the foundation for a hypothesis regarding the fate of any alien space civilizations. The hypothesis proposed two possible scenarios for these extraterrestrial civilizations. In the first scenario, a civilization would reach a critical point where it became aware of its exponential growth and recognized the dangers of expanding too far and too fast. In response, they would choose to halt their interstellar travels and refrain from further colonizing other worlds. 
In the second scenario, a civilization might fail to recognize the impending consequences of their expansion and continue their encroachment until a point of no return, leading to their eventual collapse. Remarkably, from our perspective, both scenarios would yield the same result, aliens not visiting us or revealing evidence of their existence. The distance between their civilization and ours would simply be too vast for meaningful contact or detection. The researchers dubbed this hypothesis superlinear scaling. According to this concept, a civilization grows exponentially, spreading out and colonizing other worlds, fueled by its increasing energy demands. However, as they venture What's further that? and expand, Man, they uh, I didn't sign for him. I, I, I was going to note that there was, but um, he, he took off. Unless but, they take timely action uh, to address these issues, sure they will eventually reach a point of no return, return. return. A singularity where the collapse of their civilization yeah. becomes unavoidable. Interestingly, the researchers highlighted that if these alien civilizations were closer to us, we would likely detect signs of their existence, especially if they were on the brink of collapse. At this stage, they would be emitting enormous amounts of energy, making their presence conspicuous. This hypothesis is particularly intriguing when considering other assumptions proposed in the search for alien life. The first assumption posits that advanced civilizations may not prioritize exploring planets teeming with life especially those in the early stages of development. It is possible that these civilizations have encountered numerous biotic worlds yeah, throughout dude, the galaxy. That's funny, the but fucking, the allocation uh, of resources to investigate each one may not yep. be practical. Moreover, attempting to communicate with primitive life forms oh, might not cool. yield meaningful call... outcomes, oh, rendering such efforts less appealing oh, to advanced Andrea. beings. On the other hand, the okay. second assumption highlights that once a planet develops intelligent life, it becomes far more intriguing to advance civilizations. The rarity of intelligent life in the galaxy makes each instance of it noteworthy. Detecting signs of intelligence from afar, similar to our SETI project, becomes a priority for these civilizations. Considering the Earth's perspective, the most detectable signs of our intelligence would be the radio signals transmitted over the past century. These signals could have potentially reached around 1,300 star systems within a radius of 50 light years out of the 100 billion to 400 billion star systems in the Milky Way. However, the radio signals, unintentional techno signatures, would become indistinguishable from background noise after traveling for about a light year. With this in mind, the proposed solution suggests that even in the 1,300 star systems that could have received our signals, there is a significant chance that they wouldn't have been able to detect our unintentional transmissions. Moreover, if non-intelligent life is abundant in the galaxy, advanced civilizations might not see a reason to expend resources trying to contact potentially non-intelligent worlds. Therefore, the silence from extraterrestrial civilizations could be attributed to their lack of evidence of intelligent life on Earth. The vastness of the galaxy and the challenges of detecting intelligent civilizations from afar make it plausible that advanced alien beings have not yet noticed any indication of our intelligence. Rare Earth, proposed by Peter Ward and Ron Brownlee, suggests that the unique combination of geological and environmental conditions on Earth makes the evolution of complex and intelligent life exceedingly rare in the universe. They argue that while microbial life might emerge on some planets, the development of sophisticated life forms is highly unlikely. However, a counter hypothesis called Cosmic Zoo, proposed by William Baines and his colleague, takes a different stance. They believe that just as there are various styles of music, there are multiple ways for life to evolve from simple microbes to complex macroscopic creatures similar to animals and plants. The cosmic zoo hypothesis suggests that once life arises on a planet, it has the potential to evolve into diverse and substantial forms, provided the planet remains habitable long enough. While the debate continues, two critical caveats exist. Firstly, the origin of life on Earth, despite not being considered a unique event, remains shrouded in mystery, leaving room for the possibility that Earth's conditions are indeed rare. Secondly, the evolution of technologically advanced life, exemplified by humans on Earth, seems to have occurred just once. This uniqueness makes it challenging to estimate how common such advanced civilizations might be on other worlds. 
To determine which hypothesis holds true, scientists turn their attention to our own solar system. Several planets and moons, including Mars, Europa, Enceladus, Titan, and Venus, present opportunities to search for microbial life. The discovery of independently originated microbes in these locations would suggest that life is widespread in the cosmos, providing a significant data point. However, to differentiate between rare earth and cosmic zoo, the quest for complex macroscopic life demands exploration beyond our solar system. Europa, with its subsurface ocean beneath an icy crust, offers a tantalizing possibility for such life as hydrothermal vents on its ocean floor could potentially support animal life. Nevertheless, the search for intelligent life necessitates looking further afield to exoplanets orbiting stars beyond our sun. In 1961, Frank Drake, an American astronomer, created a simple equation to estimate the number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy. Using rough approximations, Drake calculated that there were at least 1,000 and perhaps as many as 100 million extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way alone, but these numbers are highly disputed. Perhaps life needs a planetary solar system with gas giants far from the sun and rocky planets closer in. Maybe plate tectonics and volcanoes are necessary to create a suitable atmosphere for life. Evolving life may need a large moon that causes tides, a specific temperature, or a planet with a stable orbit. With a sample size of one, the only thing we know for sure is that life developed on Earth. It's nearly impossible to determine whether or not life is rare in the universe. In a paper called Eternal Inflation and Its Implications, Alan Guth, a theoretical physicist, used the physics of inflation to elegantly show that each universe, and by the way, we're assuming the existence of an infinite number of universes, likely has only one advanced civilization. Here's how the argument goes. According to Guth, cosmic inflation spawns an infinite number of pocket universes at an extraordinary rate. In fact, every second, the number of pocket universes increases by a factor of 10 to power 37. Therefore, Guth argues, we can assume that young pocket universes vastly outnumber older universes. In other words, the average universe is remarkably young. Guth then postulates that there is a minimum time, let's call it T, required for intelligent life like ours to develop. Because we've already developed, we know that the age of our universe is greater than or equal to T. Let's imagine there is another civilization in our universe more advanced than ours. And for the sake of argument, let's assume that it is one second more advanced. If the minimum time for our civilization to develop is T, the minimum time for this more advanced civilization to develop is greater than or equal to T plus one second. Because the number of universes that satisfy the T requirement is 10 to the power of 37 times the number of universes that satisfy the T plus one second requirement. And because we know only that we live in a universe that satisfies the T requirement, it is extremely unlikely that our universe also satisfies the T plus one second requirement. It's unlikely, therefore, that there is an alien civilization in our own universe, even one second more advanced than ours. Everything I just said might be a little bit confusing. Let me take another approach. Imagine the universe as a vast and diverse canvas where countless paintings of reality come to life. Each painting represents a unique world with its own story and inhabitants. Now in this cosmic art gallery, new paintings are continuously being added to the gallery, appearing like magic with each passing moment. However, most of these new paintings are still fresh and not fully developed. Guth believes that for intelligent life to emerge and flourish within a painting, it requires a certain amount of time, like a masterpiece slowly taking shape. So, in some paintings, life might just be taking its first strokes, while in others, it may have had more time to evolve and grow. Now, here's where it gets intriguing. Imagine there's another painting nearby where life is slightly more advanced than in ours, just a tiny step ahead. According to Guth, Big Tobacco lied for decades about the dangers of secondhand smoke. Legally, here's what tobacco companies are forced to say now. Did he get you the heat transfer paperwork yet?
Uh, I was working on one this morning. I have, what? I think it'd be a Here's what they're really saying. Get the truth behind the lies at StopsWithMe.com, a program of TSET. Life at our current level is immensely greater than the ones where civilizations are just a tiny bit more advanced. Because the gallery is filled with countless paintings at our level, it becomes highly unlikely that we would find one where a civilization is only a small increment ahead. So it's quite possible that our painting holds one of the most advanced civilizations in this grand cosmic artistry. Guth's idea can be illustrated in this idea of multiple paintings and unique civilizations, adding a captivating perspective to our understanding of the universe. It prompts us to ponder the diversity of life and intelligence across this cosmic gallery, leaving us in awe of the infinite possibilities that await beyond our own canvas. Nick Bostrom, a philosopher at Oxford and director of the Future of Humanity Institute, developed an argument in a paper called are you living in a computer simulation? He argues that at least one of the following three statements must be true. It's either humans are likely to go extinct before they are post-human and able to create entirely simulated realities. A post-human civilization with the ability to run such a simulation would likely not run many simulations. We are currently living in a computer simulation. Now, using ingenious logic and mathematical reasoning, Bostrom puts forth a thought-provoking conclusion. He argues that unless we are already residing in a simulation, the belief that we will eventually become post-humans capable of running ancestor simulations is likely false. Consider the idea of how such a simulation could be created. Speculations from writers suggest that an advanced type 2 or 3 civilization might construct a colossal computer system known as a matryoshka brain. This unfathomably massive system would harness the entire energy output of a star utilizing a Dyson sphere, which is a shell surrounding the star to capture all its energy. Mathematicians have pondered the capabilities of a matryoshka brain and calculated that it could possess enough computational power to create an entire simulated universe, where we, among countless other beings, could be living unknowingly. Remarkably, this concept doesn't seem to violate any known laws of physics. It sparks a fascinating exploration of the nature of reality, the potential existence of advanced civilizations, and the profound implications of our place in a vast simulated universe. If we entertain the notion that we are living in a simulated universe, created by a highly advanced civilization with a matryoshka brain or a similar vast computational system, then the question of the existence of extraterrestrial life takes on a new perspective. In this simulated reality, the beings responsible for creating the simulation could have engineered various scenarios and worlds, including ones with intelligent life forms like us. These simulated beings, including potential aliens, might be part of the design of this grand cosmic experiment. Furthermore, if the creators of the simulation possess the ability to manipulate the parameters and variables of the simulated universe, they could introduce diverse life forms and civilizations, including those of extraterrestrial origin. As a result, the presence of aliens within this simulated reality becomes a plausible possibility. From our standpoint as simulated beings, the search for extraterrestrial life might lead to intriguing questions. Are other intelligent civilizations we encounter real entities living in their own separate simulations, or are they simulated entities like us? Moreover, if we are part of a simulated universe, the Fermi paradox could be reevaluated. Perhaps the silence from alien civilizations is a deliberate design of the simulation or the result of the limitations imposed by the creators. In the realm of quantum mechanics, entanglement allows two particles to become correlated in such a way that the state of one particle is instantly connected to the state of another, regardless of the distance between them. Superposition, on the other hand, allows quantum particles to exist in multiple states simultaneously. 
Imagine a scenario where advanced alien civilizations encode their communications and energy emissions using quantum entangled particles and superposition states. By doing so, they can create encrypted signals that appear as random noise or background radiation to less advanced civilizations' detection technologies. To an outsider, it would seem as if these advanced civilizations do not emit any detectable signals or energy signatures, leading us to perceive them as silent or non-existent. In reality, they are actively communicating and functioning within the universe, but their quantum information hiding techniques make them invisible to conventional detection methods. Furthermore, these civilizations might have developed quantum cloaking technologies that render their spacecraft and installations non-transparent to electromagnetic waves. This would enable them to move through space undetected, making it challenging for us to observe their presence. Maybe we haven't found alien life yet because their technology is so advanced that it's indistinguishable from nature. Maybe alien life exists in a form that we haven't even considered yet like beings made of energy, or living in an environment completely different from our own. Maybe intelligent life is out there, but it exists in a different dimension or parallel universe that we haven't discovered yet. Maybe intelligent life is waiting for us to reach a certain level of technological advancement before making contact. Maybe the universe is teeming with life, but we just haven't looked in the right places yet. Maybe intelligent life exists, but it's so far away from us that we'll never be able to make contact. Maybe intelligent life exists, but it's not interested in making contact with us. And maybe, just maybe, we are the only life form in the universe. After hearing Enrico Fermi utter his now famous paradox at Los Alamos, the physicist Leo Szilard immediately answered, they are among us and they call themselves Hungarians. As good an answer as any, I suppose. And that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. And what's your own solution to the Fermi paradox? You can comment below. With their deep, dark eyes and gray-skinned bodies, they are pop culture's most familiar aliens, and they are known as the Greys. But what do we know about these presumed extraterrestrials? Eyewitnesses swear they have encountered these aliens, and they believe the Greys are here on a diabolical mission, abducting humans and conducting reproductive experiments. This is a very real phenomenon. Something is happening to these people. Who are they? Where are they from? And what do they want? Are they real? It's good to have an open mind. But not so open that your brains fall out. Next on UFO Files, the mystery of the Grey's Agenda. The Grey's. They are depicted in books, magazines, and in the movies. They are commonly described as being about four feet tall, with huge bald heads that sit on gray, frail, hairless bodies. These creatures have small noses, or no noses at all, slits for mouths, no ears or visible reproductive organs, and very distinctive eyes. They come to a point not actually a point, but they just come up like almonds, big almonds. Almost a uh, black, dark brown. They're, they're dark. Those who maintain that extraterrestrials do exist often portray Grace as the bad guys of the alien world. The Grays, uh, from what I know, are just like the worker bees. When they come and get you, they come and get you. They took time out of my life and replaced it either with a black spot or with a scary memory. 
If there are greys or any other alien species, and they're here, what do they really want? What is their agenda? An effort to create an offspring race that perhaps uh, had the best qualities of humanity and the best qualities of these alien beings. Many ufologists, people who routinely research alien sightings, claim that greys have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. Records, they say, exist as petroglyphs, cave drawings, and prehistoric artwork. All around the world, we have these stories of beings coming from the heavens to Earth, star beings, whether it be the Hopi Indians in North America, uh, all these you know, South American cultures, the Mayans, the Aztecs. All around the world, there are these stories of gods visiting ancient man. 6,000-year-old artifacts have been found in what was Samaria, modern-day Iraq. Interpreters of the carvings have said they depict servants or helpers of their gods. Many of the artifacts that they've left us resemble what we would call today a modern-day gray alien. Large bulbous head, large eyes, spindly limbs, very thin bodies. Historically, UFOs or aliens go largely unmentioned again until the dawn of the modern era. It is in the 20th century that the Greys' agenda begins to take shape. According to the UFO community, since then and to this day, there has been an obvious and persistent increase in encounters with the Greys. One of the most surprising claims made by some in the UFO community is that during World War II, Hitler and the Nazis were actually in collusion with the Greys. They say the aliens gave the Nazis advanced weapons technology used during the war. Since the Second World War, literally hundreds of people have claimed experiences with the gray aliens. The number reported, the quality of the reports, the similarities of the reports, and the fact that many of these reports can be substantiated under hypnosis lends very compelling strength to the idea that this is a very real phenomenon. Something is happening to these people. No official record for alien encounters or abductions exists. However, the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, keeps an unofficial tally of UFO sightings. Their statistics show that the number of sightings have gone from a handful every year in the early part of the 20th century to dozens by the middle of the 20th century, and then thousands every year beginning in the 21st century. Well, it seems that the whole business about the alien abduction really dates from uh, the Cold War. Uh, back when there were UFOs, unidentified flying objects being spotted, and it was all these international tensions after the Second World War. According to UFO believers, the Greys first made contact through the much-debated 1947 crash in the desert outside Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell story is that a rancher named Mac Brazel came into Roswell and told a story to the newspaper about how he had found some strange debris and from that incident the roswell incident uh, we've now got an elaborate story that many of the american public think is a story of flying saucer wreckage and perhaps little alien greys whose corpses were scattered about some of whom may have survived alive and are hidden away at some secret facility the official U.S. government position? A large spy balloon went down at Roswell, not an alien spaceship. It was part of a secret project designed to detect emissions from Soviet nuclear tests. Ufologists believe otherwise. The Roswell story um, has been debated by a lot of people. But one thing that we know is that something came down about 75 miles north of Roswell Army Airfield in the summer of 1947. This was investigated by the 509th Bomber Unit's Chief Intelligence Officer, who was Captain Jesse Marcel. We know that some of this debris was taken back to the Army Air Base. We know that Marcel and the Army Air Base Commander, Colonel Blanchard, thought that this was material from a flying disc. And we know that they thought this because a press release went out immediately announcing that the U.S. Army recovered one of the infamous flying discs that was in the news at that time. 
In the years since the Roswell incident, advocates argue that all contact between the Greys and the government have been kept top secret. Despite repeated official government denials that a UFO crashed in the New Mexico desert, the stories won't die. Uh, there are now more than 400 individuals on the public record who said, I was there, I picked up pieces, I saw pieces of wreckage, I saw the craft, I saw the bodies. So Roswell is simply a question of belief. Who you choose to believe? Fact or fiction, UFO sightings increased dramatically after the Roswell incident. In the 1950s, movie makers soon seized on these stories, and for the first time, alien creatures appeared invading Earth with an agenda, sometimes evil. Films like The Thing and Plan 9 from Outer Space tapped into the public's fascination and fears of UFOs. The day the Earth stood still warned of terrible consequences if Earth did not press forward into space as a friendly partner. Stories of abduction by an alien race called the Greys soon followed. It was only really until the 1960s that people began to believe that they were actually being abducted themselves by uh, beings from other planets. In 1961, a New Hampshire couple became the first people in history to officially report being abducted by the Greys. The Betty and Barney Hill story, of course, is one of the abduction experiences that kind of kicked off the whole abduction phenomenon. The case of Betty and Barney Hill remains the seminal alien abduction tale. It stands as the first ever recorded encounter with the Greys, the most popularly noted alien species said to visit the Earth. It allegedly occurred near Portsmouth, New Hampshire on September 19, 1961. To this day, skeptics cannot dispute every detail of the story. Believers see the Hills incident as the defining moment in gray history when the nation and the world awoke to the troubling phenomenon of alien abduction. In her last on-camera interview, the late Betty Hill shared her experience. My husband, Barney, and I are returning from Montreal, Canada. We're traveling down through the White Mountains of New Hampshire when we suddenly spot what we thought was a new star in the sky. And as we watched this, it changed direction and came in towards us. Barney pulled over, grabbed a pair of binoculars, and stepped out of the car to get a closer look at the menacing flying object. Betty Hill's niece, Kathy Martin, was a teenager when this incident occurred. At that time, through the binoculars, he saw the leader, what he called the leader, and crew members. There were people looking down at him... And as he's watching, it began to descend. And at this point, he became frightened. He ran back to the car, yelling that they were trying to capture us. She was screaming to him, Barney, you damn fool, come back here. Get back here. They sped off. A short while later, they heard a buzzing sound. They turned onto a logging road and stopped. There was a roadblock and there were people in the road. With the Wells Fargo Active Cash Credit Card, earn unlimited 2% cash back on purchases you want. Ow. Like dance lessons. Ow, ow, ow. And on what you need, like memory foam inserts. Ah. That's real life ready. Visit wellsfargo.com slash active cash. Terms apply. The people approached the car and they realized at that point that they were not human. That they were the people that Barney had seen in the UFO. 
This is where their memory lapsed. The next thing they fully consciously remembered was they were driving down the highway again and they proceeded home. When the Hills noticed the time, they realized that about two hours had elapsed that neither of them could account for. That was just the beginning of a mystery that would soon unravel. For nearly two years after their experience, the Hills had troubling nightmares. They went to several medical specialists and eventually were referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon, a highly respected Boston psychiatrist and neurologist with an extensive background in hypnotic therapy. Dr. Simon told us these UFO people had caused us to have amnesia. And Dr. Simon removed the amnesia so that we could remember clearly all that had happened. They took us on board the craft, their craft. And we were taken into separate rooms. They were very human looking. They had two arms, two legs. The only difference basically were their facial features. The noses were very, very small. Almost no nose. Small lips, small nose. They examined my eyes, ears, nose, throat, skin, hair, and all. And then I was put on a table where they scraped my skin in an attempt to find out if our skin was alike or different. Hill says an alien conducted sexual experiments on them. They took semen from Barney. Betty may have had eggs extracted. He tried to insert a needle-like instrument in my navel, which caused pain, so he stopped doing it. And I was grateful for that. Years later, Betty Hill produced the first alleged eyewitness depiction of the Greys since ancient drawings and carvings. They portrayed the alien leader, who showed her a tantalizing clue to indicate where they came from. I asked him where he was from, and he showed me a star map. In a hypnotherapy session, two years a week. after her encounter, That's Betty cool. drew a map Three of the alien star system. At the time, okay, experts could not it. identify it. Really? Really? But then, in 1966, Marjorie Fish, an enterprising ufologist and amateur astronomer, became fascinated by Betty Hill's star map. Fish spent the next seven years examining the map and constructing models, trying to match it to a known star system. It was only later, when a new star was discovered, that they found exactly what Betty had drawn on the star map. In 1973, after reviewing 23 star models, Marjorie Fish claimed to have found a fit. She declared that Betty Hill had drawn a star system some 40 light years from Earth, Zeta Reticuli. At the California Institute of Technology, Dr. Charles Beichman, one of the world's foremost astronomers, examined Zeta Reticuli. We have no way that could possibly travel that far. We don't know of any way for any solid vehicle to go that sort of a distance. But relatively speaking, within the scale of the galaxy, it's a very nearby star. In a conventional Earth-based space shuttle, it would take nearly a million and a half years to reach Zeta Reticuli. In addition to his duties with the California Institute of Technology and the Jet Propulsion Lab, Dr. Beichman is a leading member of NASA's Origins program. Their mission is to probe space for signs of life. He concedes that life is possible in the universe, maybe even on Zeta Reticuli. Here we're looking at the two stars in the Zeta Reticulum system, about 40 light years away. The binary stars could well have planets around stars like this. The system is old enough that, in fact, you could have 
a stable life having evolved on any habitable planets in those systems. Again, prospects good. What do we know today? Nothing. With just tantalizing evidence, but no definitive proof that the greys actually come from Zeta Reticuli, Betty Hill's case continues to be hotly debated. However, skeptics and believers can agree that since that night in September 1961, hundreds of alien abductions have been reported. Just as a disease is contagious, so can an idea be contagious and, uh, and spread from person to person. Did Betty Hill really meet aliens from Zeta Reticuli? Did they conduct reproductive experiments as part of an evil agenda? Are the people claiming to have been abducted reporting the truth? They're dreaming with their eyes open. So they have these hypnopompic, or upon awakening, hallucinations. That's the tactile sensations, the lights, the buzzing, and, the, and especially the sense of presence. So many times the debunkers try to explain abductions as people simply mimicking and repeating stories that have been passed around over the years. Well, here's some people who had nothing to go by. <laughs> Nobody had ever reported this, and yet their abduction experience is remarkably similar to what we hear from people even to this very day. real change. I've lost weight and I'm keeping it off. We go be help reduce my appetite. We go be is the number one prescribed once weekly weight management medicine for adults with obesity or some with excess weight. People taking we go be lost an average of 35 pounds. Some lost over 46 pounds. Wegovy shouldn't be used with other semaglutide-containing or GLP-1 receptor agonist medicines. Don't take Wegovy if you have a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, or if you are allergic to Wegovy. Stop taking Wegovy and get medical help right away if you get a lump or swelling in your neck, severe stomach pain, itching, rash, trouble breathing, or swelling of your face or throat. Serious side effects may happen, including pancreatitis. Gallbladder problems may occur. Wegovy may cause low blood sugar in people with type 2 diabetes, especially if you take medicines to treat type to diabetes. Tell your provider about vision problems or changes, or if you feel your heart racing while at rest. Cap, what's up, man? What are you doing? How are you? How are you? I forgot I could talk. I'm stupid. I'm really stupid. Are you right on, dude? Everything going okay? Can you hear me okay? I'm like, hang on. Let me turn it Um. Migovi helped us. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, man, how you doing? You doing okay? You doing okay? Uh, it's awesome to hear from you. I uh, I was looking. I saw where you, you messaged me about. Um, man, he hit me up. Actually, he hit me up. And uh, I, okay, you know what? Actually, I want to talk to him. I've got a couple things that I got to run run by him. <laughs> uh, I just want to ask. I just want to ask. I want to know if he's got, if he's like, I don't know. It is funny, dude. He's, I want to ask him if he's like this fucking alien. I want to ask him what his fucking ordeal is. Like, why? Oh, really? Oh, good. Like a blow retard. <laughs> Yeah. Like a full blown retard, yeah. Well, good. Yeah, I know. I'm because I want to see who's going to fucking do it first. Um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I want to ask him why he's so against fucking. I know, I told her to bring it to him. She told me that fucking yeah, Whitney was saying that she he was chasing her and his brother were chasing Whitney down or something. Cats, hang up for a second. I don't know. Oh yeah. 
and they were. Am I breaking up? Hang on, I'm gonna move to a place where I want. I wanna, I wanna talk. I wanna talk. I wanna, I wanna. I'm gonna, dude. I'm getting ready to seriously. I want to. Now, I'm not saying. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they're right here. For some reason, I had them sitting there waiting to. Oh, they were right here. Maybe two orders. Usually, like this is one for sixty-eight orders. Oh, there is two. That's what he said. I was waiting. He said there was another one. Yeah, he took them. They took them. He probably took them over there to get. Oh, Seiko. I think he took them and filled them because they were over here. Caps, hang on. Yeah, there was another one he said he was he'd been looking for, and uh, so I just waited. Majestic 12 or MJ-12 documents, they suggested that on July 9, 1947, President Harry S. Truman appointed 12 high-ranking military and national security personnel and authorized them to conduct a covert mission. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, research and development intelligence offer. Okay. All right, Caps, check it out. So listen, man, okay, here's what I want to do. This is what I want to This is what I want to do. <laughs> Uh, how many, how much, oh, I only got 10 minutes on this before, I, before my two hours is up. Man, they're never going to move me to level two. Did you hear me play Eye of the Tiger? Because I was sitting there saying that, I was like, today we're going to fucking get to level two, me and Lincoln. So we were playing Eye of the Tiger, all fucking pumping ourselves up to get to level two. It did not work. <laughs> we are not at level two, so, uh, we tried to play that to get ourselves pumped up and the motivation failed. Uh, we totally failed at it, Caps. We, I mean, we were like jamming out to Eye of the Tiger for, well, it couldn't have been over two hours because that's where I'm stuck with. But man, I thought the motivation would be there. I thought we would totally fucking, I put a little, like, one of those, like, sweat bands around Lincoln's head. We were fucking sitting there, like, running up the stairs and running back down. You know, Rocky. And we were like, yes. And I, and, uh, yeah, it didn't work. Totally didn't fucking work, but it was a, it was one of our live things, and I don't know if nobody else got it. I thought it was funny, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, listen to me. Here's a, check this out. Okay. This ambassador guy, which is a very real alien, or live, so he's gonna listen to this. Um, absolutely true. I've gotta talk to him because I wanna talk to him. I want to know, anyway, no, 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 sorry, I'm getting ahead, way ahead of myself, uh, listen, okay, uh, I, okay, yeah, on Messenger, like, <laughs> we don't talk like we're homies, but we talk, you know, and I was like, dude, hit me up, because, uh, I was doing a live whatever. He is always asking me if he can get on here. And then he, and then he talks like, like me and Joe Rogan are homie. I'm like, oh yeah, hang on. Let me, uh, we, he just came over last week, but we didn't talk business stuff. You know, we just shoot. Like, I don't, Joe Rogan is not going to get you on the, <laughs> or on his podcast. But for some reason, he thinks that me and Joe Rogan are fucking homies. Like, I mean, I don't, I've never claimed to, I don't know why he seems, you know what, he might be listening right now. Ambassador, 
I know that you are really, truly, I want you to call in because I want to talk to you. I got to ask you a couple things. And all it is, legit question, is, shit, I got to figure out how I'm going to formulate the question. You know what I mean? This is why journalists, <laughs> I'm really serious about this too. I think that's why I'm laughing. I can't take it that see. I'm trying. Caps, you know I'm trying. You can hear it in my voice. I know you were there. I know. That's what I'm saying. So, listen, this is what, are we, this is what I'm going to have to do. And I need you guys' help on this shit, too. <laughs> Actually, I don't... <laughs> he told me that he blocked you because he heard you saying something about... I don't... He was like... I blog caps. He didn't tell me. He was saying this over over Messenger, but I guess he got upset because he heard you guys laughing at him about him or something. I don't know what it was, but after you were like, what did he block me from? I was like, I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't talked to him since then. Now I got a million questions. Like when I asked him, I was like, so what do you guys do on these other planets? And this is a legit question. He thought I was being a smart ass. Like, I was like, you know, we watch football and stuff. Like, what do you guys do on these other planets? And he said, we raise our young. I was like, that is not an answer. That's a, I mean, I raise my young too, but we still watch football and fucking sit around with our thumbs up our ass. But you guys don't have those, so you can't sit around with your thumb up your ass. So, I want to know. That's not a, that is not a rude or ungestured not. You know what I'm saying? I want to know. And since they don't have anal buttholes, I know that they can't be sitting there with their thumb up there. As they probably got their, you know what? I'm Casey. This is why he could be listening. You know what? I don't care what happens to me, but man, don't hurt my dog. You know what I'm saying? Just don't hurt my dog. This alien that's calling. I will, I, I will not be okay with an alien hurting our dog. They can um, kick your ass, but not my bubbies. Okay. You should see his badge. Sober today, like, that's life. His badge was not Googled or made up. I guess he didn't get in Israel. Maybe I'll stay up way too long. I thought people were chasing her in the neighborhood and shit. I'm like, oh, I'm so fucking glad that's not me. Sand Springs, y'all are going to jail. Yeah, I know how that one goes there, though. Yeah, dude, been there. Um, dude, three twelves a week. His badge is amazing balls. <laughs> what? what? Three tw- three twelves a week. And That's awesome. Full time. Seven to seven. I was like, fuck yeah, I'll do it. That's only, wow. Yeah, I went. Thirty six. Well, can I work there? I'm serious. I want to go work at the fucking hospital. Okay. I'll get you a job there. Then we can move and I can go to fuck away from here. They won't care. I don't think anybody will let me drive a forklift with methadone. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I'm doing this on live thing. I don't know. Uh, yeah. What are you talking about? I don't know. Have you seen this That's YouTube link? No. He has a YouTube link? You're right. I'm going. He's, Do your thing. Uh, he's the CEO of the Majestic 12. What is that? Uh, the Majestic 12. What is that? I'm fucking nothing. <laughs> oh, man. He's, see, I don't talk shit about just anybody, but when you leave yourself out there, it's not my fault. Fuck him. He's a prat. <laughs> what? Like $280. He, it's for him for a car accident thing. I, I, I knew it. I mm-hmm. knew it. That's how he's been getting by. Oh, no. Yeah, he's literally fucking causing accidents, and it's not caught up with him. You know what? I want to post this badge just because I thought it was real. I think it looked real. Me? I'm on tonight. You're, you're right. Jillian White? No. No, but you might have to go undercover and go talk to this dude. I got a couple questions. Well, I just, my thing is, is he was so, first he was talking that he was an alien. Then he said that. 
Yeah. For some reason, the cops or people or we got to get our dogs or something fucked up happens. I'll meet you right here. I will always have my dogs. Probably yeah. before I have you. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, there's a nuclear fallout. Okay, Billy Lincoln here. Where's the fuck's here? Okay. All right, we'll go get it later. What? No, I'm sure you'll have that cat. It'll be on your vagina. What? Katie said they she take kittens from. Oh Jesus, because they need more. I don't care. It's for Brandy. Because Josie got one. Wow, I'm 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 running out of time. Okay. Uh. Yeah, you better go back in there. Jason's like. Oh, I don't care about them. Uh. Okay, I'm running out of time, here. No, that was the front, the entryway. No, it was an entryway. There's, this was a, no. This was like where you go into the front door. Yep, it was. Past tense. Non plural. What? Uh, I don't really, honestly don't know. No. Okay, listen, Caps, I'm, uh, I've got one minute. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta exit at, at, it's up here, but, uh, I think I'm gonna do another one. Are you, hey, do you have a show going on? Oh, you even, okay, cool, I'm gonna check this out. Hey, do you have a, are you, you do later? Okay. No. Hit me up and, uh, let me know when, or, yeah, definitely hit me up, uh, it's the other side. <laughs> Man, we've been stuck in here for hours. <laughs> <laughs> a few hours okay uh let me know i've got 30 seconds i the tiger did not work to further my